a classic 911. Now, this isn't very me, is it? If you know what the channel is about, I normally like looking for kind of forgotten gems, underrated things, cars that they've depreciated quite hard and now they're an absolute bargain, that kind of thing. But today we have the complete opposite. We have a car where 15 years ago you could pick one of these up for under £10,000 if you knew that you had a bit of work to do to it. And now you won't see much change out of £50,000 before they get any good. There's a huge explosion in value. Now, obviously, we're going to talk about why, but as I've titled this video, I'm calling this a hype check because honestly, don't come at me just yet. Historically, I'm not a big Porsche fan. And that doesn't mean that I dislike them. I'm not acidic, I'm not alkaline, I'm pH 7, right? I get it, they're cool, but they don't stir anything in me. It's just, it's not on my radar as what I would spend my money on. Again, don't come at me just yet. Sheathe those angry Germanic fingers for a second. It's a bit for me like Max Verstappen winning all the Formula One races with Red Bull. You can't deny that the car's fantastic. You can't deny that he's an incredible driver. I just, you know, I've seen them win all the group tests decade after decade, and it's so just predictable. I know they're great. But no, that's not the sole story of this video. Does it impress somebody who's not that into Porsches? It's part of it. That's, it's perhaps my angle. But also, having spoken to Johnny, the owner, who's had this car for 14 years and has done 60,000 miles um, and has developed all sorts of genius engineering parts for it, more on that later, Hearing him talk about it gives you a really good insight as to why people are flocking to these and just what an experience they offer and why they sit so sweetly in the 911 range. Also, good news, last weekend, I drove my first 911 after about 100 and something cars that I've, been, I've driven. I can't believe I finally did it. It was, only, it was a 996 Targa, so nobody is calling that an iconic one. You have to go and try first and it completely, completely stole my heart. I got it within meters of driving it. I was like, ah, this is what they talk about. This is why it wins the group tests. Okay, cool. But of course, that's a car that was 19,000 pounds and offers really, really good value for money. And so the other question is, if you've got 50 grand, I'm wondering how, how different is it? And is it really worth that 30,000 pounds difference? So let's get into it. So let's talk about not just the classic car experience, but why the 911 SC, 1978 to about 82, 83. This is considered by many to be the absolute sweet spot of a classic 911 experience. You're at the tail end of the first G body, which is what this is, and you've got all the kind of delightful engines and you've got really good reliability at this point. They, this is where German engineering was ga gaining its reputation, by the way. Um, it's that really analog experience just before they started introducing quite a few kind of ECUs and sensors and things like that. You don't find the engine is idling strangely and have to go, I wonder if a sensor needs looking at and needs changing. It's all back to basics, old school. And obviously it's the way it makes you feel. So sitting in here, it is old, yeah, 40 years old. It just feels like a gorgeous time capsule. It really does make you feel like you've gone back to the 1980s. It's, I, I absolutely love it. And that normally means you, you've got pros and cons of living with old cars. You've got knackered air con and rubbish heating and everything else like that. And this is the interesting thing about why people like to go towards 911, classic 911 ownership compared to say Italian or British cars, because you can actually live with these cars. The almost unique thing about owning a classic 911, people want to drive them and daily them so much that there's only very few that people are holding onto as collector's items near the top with low mileage. And people are happy to aftermarket modify their car to make it better to live with. Johnny's uh, business, Classic Retrofit, um, as an, uh, from an engineering background, and owning one of these, he just decided he wanted to make better aircon that was it better to live with and absolutely tiny and efficient over down there at the front of the car. It no longer had to sit at the back of the engine, sapping power from there, ignition and fuses and retrofitting air ducts and things for better airflow around the car. At the moment, they're developing one single unit which handles the heating and the cooling. And basically, 
allows you to get rid of this enormous chunky 20 kilo exhaust at the back um, and allows you to have race headers like this car. So there's all sorts of clever things, but the values go up for cars that have actually been made easier to live with. The whole Singer scene has really got people into the idea of making changes to their classic cars, particularly when there are so many on offer in the 911s. What's it like in the interior? Well, well tiny. I can't believe how small this car is. It's, it's delightful. It's so narrow. It doesn't have those wide 911 hips at the rear. It feels MX-5 small to me. However, you do actually have usable space back here to throw items in. The shot I've included now with my big camera rucksack, it is a far deeper than usual camera rucksack, but as you'll see, it does take up basically all of the seat by itself. And you've obviously got that usable fruit, frunk, whatever, wherever you're from. Wherever you're from. For a 40 year old car, we've got electric windows. We've got an electric sunroof. We've got usable space. We've got heating and aircon. You can sometimes get heated seats, I believe. These are nice cars to actually take out. And I think we're at a good spot now where we should talk about actually getting this out on the road. The first thing about the driving experience, I'm six foot tall, not particularly long legs. My left knee touches the wheel most of the time and I'm right next to the gear knob as well. The pedals are completely offset, so you have to drive a little bit cramped. The wheel doesn't go up. This is immediately pretty old school and analog feeling. You've got a clutch where the biting point is super duper high. That feels very peculiar if you ask me. And the first thing that you notice is the completely unassisted steering. Very slow gear change required. I've already been out for a drive with Johnny to make sure that I drive it properly. You know, I don't end up damaging this thing because it is precious. It's 40 years old. Doesn't feel it, but it is 40 years old with 168,000 miles. It's, it boggles the mind. Okay, so second gear pull, flat out. That flat six sounds fantastic. Oh. You would estimate that you were doing 0 to 60 in low five seconds in this car. It really feels quick. So what do we have? Well, we've got a three litre naturally aspirated flat six, developing in earliest guys, 180 horsepower. And in this instance, well, in the European market, this is. And in this instance, we're, we're developing 204 brake horsepower. Um, now let's, where does it go down here actually? Yeah, let's go down there, let's see what happens. Ooh, ooh, heavy steering, heavy steering. Um, so I've seen somewhere 0 to 60 of 6.5 seconds, and I believe that could be for the um, for the 180 brake horsepower version. Johnny quotes, uh, I think he said 5.9 or 5.7 for this for this one. But it's all the power you need in almost any car anyway. And the sensation of speed, there's a drastic difference in this. There are so many cars today where we're just completely cocooned away and cosseted away from the real world. And you have to be doing absurd speeds to feel like you're going quickly. I think that's, again, part of the charm of something of this, of this age and with napple sound deadening. I believe this car weighs factory about 1,270 kilos. I think that's 2,800 pounds for Americans. It's so small, it's so narrow, it feels so engaging. It feels completely 100% in contact with the road at all times. It's not exhausting to drive, but it requires your full concentration. One of the things Johnny says he loves most about this car is the fact that these cars are just bought to be driven. They're designed to be driven. And historically, the SC was Porsche basically deciding to make their car 
slightly less aimed at the enthusiast and more usable for everyday folk. And this appears to be, 40 years on, a really nice balance of that. I'd say I've driven this car now in total for probably 45 minutes. And I've taken it on a good number of different roads, dual carriageway, country lanes, doddled it about. What are my thoughts overall? Well, the first thing you notice is just how, I know analog is a really overused word, but when you're talking about a 40 year old car, it's the applicable. It makes you think about every single input like you're learning to drive again in the most exciting way. Do you remember how you felt when you were probably 17 and it was just you're a ball of nerves about driving and yet everything's super exciting but you're analyzing every input you require full attention even for the gear changes you, you don't just depress the clutch go into the next one at the speed you like that's not what this car wants you really have to think everything through there's no assist there's no assist in your braking and you're thinking about your weight balance of the car if you were deciding to press on for example so it it's just utterly charming in that sense because you know I do 20,000 miles a year I've driven probably well over a hundred cars now there's not many cars that have if any that I can remember that have forced me to go back to basics kind of concentration on on, on these things and it's just fun it's such a, it's such an engaging experience you look around you you hear these these sounds there's hardly any deadening in here and it's just evident that this is a sense of occasion and you feel like you've gone back in time. I don't know where the f I'm going, by the way. So, if we're going to talk next about the steering, that's the iconic thing with these cars and why they're so loved as well. You've got all the power to the rear wheels, you've got all the weight to the rear wheels, and it, despite there being no power assist on this steering, it it just feels it just feels the right it feels the right weight in a straight line. It actually feels a lot lighter than I expected. Immediate immediate turn in, immediate response when you're moving the wheel around, and yet as soon as you actually go into a bend or a slow corner or whatever it weights up you can actually feel the tires on the road you can feel everything that's going on there's a little jiggle that's kind of always happening off um, when you're going in a straight line and it's just actually reminding you you're driving a machine an untamed machine on the road yeah i could eat this steering for breakfast it's just brilliant and it's even nicer than that 996 steering which i was frothing about the other day the suspension i think it's I daily drive a Volvo, so I think everything that isn't that is going to feel a bit firm. But by modern standards, it's not super, superbly comfortable, but it's also not uncomfortable. It's not crashy, and I could easily do many, many, many hours in this car, grinning like an idiot the entire way. I'm not going to talk too heavily about the dynamics of this car. I'm not going to just regurgitate what other people have said. We weren't able to get me fully comprehensively insured on this car today, despite our best efforts. And I, it's disrespectful, I think, to be given this opportunity to drive a car this amazing uh, that someone's had for 14 years and to start throwing it into bends. I don't think that's really the spirit for me. So let's just keep this thing working. <laughs> and what I can add is that this is the era where Porsche had already made their adjustments to the earliest, earliest ones that were famous for spinning out. And even then, Johnny said to me, you really had to be attacking a road and then suddenly lifting off the, th lifting off the throttle to, like, to unsettle it. Um, people still throw them around tracks and know what they're doing and don't spin out on every single bend. So they've earned the reputation, but it might kind of be down to a few idiots that have done that. But anyway, by this point, they're far, far more set and you, I'm not in fear that I'm going to spin out at any point. There's no doubt about it that this is, a, is an experience. And this is what people are buying into when they decide to take on the extra work of owning a classic car. 
I do love it already. And yet, it's just the right amount of dailyable as well. Johnny genuinely drives this all the time, everywhere. He's done 60,000 miles in a classic car. And he said to me, what other car from 1981, or 82, sorry, would you do 60,000 miles in? He said, what other car, English or Italian or whatever else, after six months of it being under a cover, not really doing your proper checks and everything on it and just turning it on and it starts first time because there's that much faith that this thing works. He said he got so, he's got so used to this behaving for the last 11, sorry, 14 years, he once found himself halfway to Germany before he remembered he hadn't checked oil levels and, and fluids and things because it's been that dependable to him. Does it feel 50,000 pounds good? I'm going to answer that question for me. I don't quite think I would. And that's not any disrespect to the car. I just think, for me personally, I got so much value and joy out of driving a 996, my least favorite looking one, let's be honest. I got so much joy out of that 996 for under half the money that I think I would find a middle ground and I'd probably get a 997 or something um, in whatever spec I fancied. Because it's still very analog and it still feels like a significant step up as a driving experience over most modern cars anyway. And it's got better crash safety and stuff. And that sounds like a lame thing to say, but I've had two crashes and it does remind you of your mortality when things are unexpected or go wrong. So if I had the money to, to get a third car for fun, and it had to be a classic car, absolutely. Yeah, that's when the 50,000 pounds makes sense to me. I think it really depends on if it's your second or third car and what it means to you. It feels modern enough in so many positive ways. It feels so old school in all the most charming ways. I'd love to know though, what you would do. And um, obviously pick me up on where I went wrong. I'm not an expert on Porsche bits, so please do correct me in the comments and add something I've forgotten to mention. Um, I would really love to know. So please do like and subscribe. You know that whole jazz, but it does really make a difference. Um, you know, these videos take a long time to make. And so the more people who are actually watching them and being appreciative of them, it's, it's really rewarding. And it, it kind of pushes me and gets me up to go and actually do it. So we'd really support. Anyway, that's Waffle. That's enough breakfast for us all. Thank you. See you later.